Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Nicole Lamberson, and I trained as a physician assistant. I'm also a member of the outreach team for the film Medicating Normal, and I host conversations like the one we're about to have. Our guest today is Brooke Seam. She's an award-winning chef and writer. Her work has appeared in the Washington Post, Eating Well Magazine, Esquire, The Rumpus. Did I say that right? Yep, that's correct. <laughs> okay. The New York Post, Fast Company, and more. She is a good network chopped champion and was named as one of Zagat's 30 under 30 in 2014. She's also the creator of Happiness is a Skill, a newsletter devoted to educating people on antidepressant withdrawal, safe deprescribing, and learning the skill of happiness. And most importantly, her memoir, May Cause Side Effects, which I have here, is available now wherever books are sold. And it just released yesterday, yesterday. right? Yeah. Yay, congratulations. <laughs> so I guess to start, how's it going? How's the book uh, release? How does it feel to have a book out there? Yeah, a little anticlimactic, to be honest. Uh, this has been a six year long process for me. I went through antidepressant withdrawal in 2016 and 2017. And I started writing the book in about the middle of 2017. So in a lot of ways, it just kind of feels like an extension of what I've been working on for such a long time that, you know, yesterday was kind of a normal day, but there was yeah. also a lot of really fabulous messages from people I love and strangers and reviewers. And so a lot, lots of good stuff, but I will say it's a little anticlimactic. Yeah. In a I really saw good way. Yeah. <laughs> I saw on your um, social media that you said, you know, you had tons of edits that you had to put the book through. So does it get to a, like, now that it's published, it's final, right? Like you don't ever change it again. Um, For the most part, there'll be some yeah. minor changes. Like if there's just, you know, all books have little errors. They're kind of like Easter eggs, you know, maybe a, a missed period or something like that. So there'll be some small changes for the paperback when yeah. that comes out probably in around a year and then also um you know second editions but the content is is 100 what it's going to be for the rest of time okay so let's jump into the book and I guess how would you describe the book and who do you want to read it what what kind of impact do you want it to have that kind of thing I, there was a reviewer who said this morning that it was like eat pray love meets a recovery memoir which in some ways is very accurate. In other ways, it's a little, uh, it's a little, it's not quite right because recovery memoirs, you know, you tend to think maybe substance abuse or, um, you know, uh, like just abuse recovery in general, whereas this is antidepressant withdrawal and antidepressant recovery, which is kind of a very different thing and not really what we think of when we think of recovery. But at the same time, it is very much a recovery memoir. You know, I think everybody here has, you know, probably seen Medicating Normal or at least on some level knows what's going on um, with the film. And so you understand, you understand the, the context, right? I was medicated for something that was normal. My father died when I was 15. And, you know, to help cope with it, I was put on a cocktail of antidepressants. And I was, you know, I was a teenager. It was 2001 it was what was doctor recommended. And I stayed on those same drugs for the next 15 years. And it wasn't until I was 30 and I was doing objectively terrible. I mean, I was severely depressed. I was having suicidal ideations. My life, you know, I guess was objectively okay. You know, I could support myself and, you know, had a job and all that stuff, but I was, I was not doing well. And so the, the story is really about what happened when I decided to get off those drugs and how difficult the process was and how misinformed all my doctors were and how kind of the way we view mental health as a concept really just crashed up against my experience of withdrawal and how psychologically painful that was and all the things I had to do in order to get through what for me was about a year of severe withdrawal. So the book is about that. And I, and I really hope that when people read it, that it helps people who are in withdrawal just feel less alone, less insane, because here's, you know, somebody else who has validated this experience, hopefully on a really big level one day. Um, also, I really hope it helps parents 
who are considering medicating their children or are perhaps, you know, helping adult children who are currently going through withdrawal or trying to get off antidepressants or other psychiatric drugs. And then, and then of course, I really hope that doctors read it and specifically prescribers, because not only do they need to know what, you know, a good chunk of people experience, but I hope it helps them recognize the science and have a little bit more compassion for their patients. Yeah. Yeah, all great audiences for everybody, you know, really needs to read the book and learn. There's just so much like pervasive ignorance around this topic out there. Um, so, um, you know, can you give us a brief summary, I guess, of what drugs you were on and how many? Was it just one or was it a polypharmacy situation? So it was a little, it was a little bit polypharmacy. Um, I, it, so, you know, when I talk about what I was on compared to what I hear from stories of people, I mean, my situation seems tame and yet it still created a huge amount of chaos. So I was put on Effexor XR 37.5 milligrams and Wellbutrin XL 150 uh, milligrams. Those were the only two psychiatric drugs that I were on and that, 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 that combination and the dosages were never changed. So I guess I was lucky in the sense that I didn't have my dose up and up and up over the years. My doctors were just very passive and just kept refilling the same thing without asking questions. Mm -hmm. um, but when I started taking those drugs, I started having a lot of physical symptoms that we ultimately medicated me for. So my thyroid started going a little wonky. So I was on two separate doses of, of Synthroid. Um, I also developed something called bile reflex disease, which is basically like heartburn, but lower down in your GI system. So your pancreas like spits back bile into your stomach and it doesn't feel good. So I was medicated for that. Um, I was also, uh, you know, I was a teenager at the time, so I had acne. So I was put on an antibiotic to deal with that, which I was on for years, which is bizarre in retrospect. And, you know, then birth control for being a woman in this country and a teenager at that. So in all, all in all, there was about seven drugs that I was on usually at one time or another. But the interesting part about me is that I was put on all of them within about a year and then nothing changed. So I was not someone who had a constantly changing cocktail. So it was both polypharmacy in the sense that there was many different drugs, but not in the sense that once we got those, they stayed the same for the next, you know, decade and a half. Yeah. Yeah. So do you think um, in hindsight then that a lot of the physical type ailments that you were having, the reflux and the thyroid and everything was a result of the antidepressants or you can't really say? I mean, like, I guess I can't really say, but I can kind of assume it, it, it was either a huge coincidence or connected, right? Because I didn't have these issues growing up when I was a kid. And then I started taking these drugs and I did start having these issues and no one ever suggested that maybe they were connected. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the tricky part for me, the wrench that's thrown in is that I was also uh, grieving and grief can do a lot of things to the physical body. It can change, you know, how people operate. So I don't really know like to what extent grief was a factor in some of my physical symptoms versus the drugs. But what I can say is that when I got off the antidepressants, um, you know, at 30, my thyroid has totally cleared up. I've not had an issue with that since. I've also not had an issue with the bile reflux disease since. Um, and, you know, I got off literally all of the prescription drugs I was on and have not had any sort of physical relapses. So I still have, I still have GI problems that I've been dealing with through other ways, but I think that's more from, you know, the abuse of 15 years of the antidepressants and antibiotics. Yeah. Yeah. And I've heard other people, I mean, I know it's just anecdote, but we have a lot of anecdote because there's a lot of people <laughs> who are on psychiatric medications and they come in the groups, you know, the support groups, once they figure out something's wrong and there, there are other people reporting the similar thyroid issues and reflux type stuff. And I personally had like rashes and, you know, so lots yeah. of physical manifestations. Um, you said that you were drugged for, um, you know, the death of your father at a young age. And that's something you and I have in common. I lost a parent at a young age too. And I wonder if you think, uh, back in hindsight that, um, you know, there's something else, something better for kids who have lost parents or just grieving, like what was missing at the, at the time, other than just being put on an antidepressant. 
I mean, I think my answer is the same for both kids and parents. Or, I mean, we're kids and adults, mm-hmm. but I'm not a parent, so I can't, you know, I can't fully understand, but having, you know, talked through my mother and a lot of parents, I think that there's a bit more urgency around children because the consequences feel really scary. But for both adults and kids, I really think the answer is a lot more time and patience and an understanding that this is a huge loss, right? I mean, the loss of a parent for a child is, you know, one of the greatest traumas that they can go through. So to expect them to kind of, you know, be back to normal in a few weeks or a few months, or even to be like they were before, I think is, is just too much pressure and too much of an expectation to put on the kid. But what happens is we get really wrapped up in the idea that, okay, like I was 15, right? When you're 15, what's happening? You're taking the PSATs, you're prepping for the SATs, you know, you're probably thinking about college, you really want to be liked, you want to get asked to the prom, right? There's all these big teenage things that feel really important. And like, you know, if she doesn't take her AP class, then she's going to get behind for next year, right? There's this, there's this hierarchy of things we've decided that it is necessary for, for, teens to have to be successful. And when that process is interrupted through something, you know, like trauma, the instinct is to get them back on the path as soon as possible. But for me, I really think that what I needed was time. Like I wasn't the kind of kid who was going to go from making A's to getting D's and doing drugs. It just wasn't who I, who I was. Mm -hmm. I may have had a year of getting B's and not fully been at home, but I really wonder what would have happened had I been allowed to process that, that grief and that emotion at the time, rather than have it be numbed away. Um, And I think that that is the case for anyone who's going through grief and we're just not very good at letting people grieve in this culture. And we're also not very good at recognizing when someone's still not doing well six months later. You know, it's okay for a few weeks, but six months later, everyone's annoyed and wants to go back to their life, right? So until we can kind of shift that, I think we're going to just keep tossing drugs at people to help them get over this very human, natural, terrible time. Yeah. And also like communication. I mean, I, I know when, when my mom died, it seemed like no, like uh, nobody wanted to talk about it anymore after a certain period of time, it was just like, okay, you know, and, uh, that was it. So do you feel like the people around you, the adults, the guidance counselors, that kind of thing, like engaged you in talking about how you were feeling, or it was just like, that's over and everybody moved on type of thing. You know, I'd say neither. And honestly, it's because I'm, I've always been an introvert at heart. I'm pretty intense. I don't tend to have a lot of interest in talking to people. Just yeah. as a concept. Um, so for me, I felt I didn't like all the attention that was being turned on me. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I didn't want to talk about it all the time. Like I did just kind of want to go back to school and just live my life. And I think that in my case, that not wanting to talk about it, that kind of, you know, I didn't cry for weeks that that just kind of almost like she's kind of just being fine was Mm -hmm. actually what was more concerning to the adults around me than having a kid who was crumpled up on the floor. Again, I think I just needed time and, Mm -hmm. but it was an odd response and people didn't understand it. So we had to go check it out to make sure there was nothing wrong with me. Right. Which, yeah. Which, how did that make you feel? I hear from a lot of kids and people that like, as soon as you enter the system, right, you're in front of a psychiatrist or even a psychologist or a therapist. One of the criticisms of, you know, going to even talk therapy is that it sort of sends the message that like something is wrong with you. You're at the doctor, you're seeking help. So as a kid, I'm just wondering if, you know, you went to get checked out and you had a sense or a feeling that people thought you were broken or something was wrong. For me, I absolutely had that sense. It was it was 2001, so the time was different. I think if you were a kid, maybe in this day and age, who's grown up listening to your parents talk about therapy, like they talk about going to the grocery store, you might not see it as something that was abnormal. But I was the only kid I knew who was uh, going, who was in therapy and then also on antidepressants. So there was a lot of shame around it. And I, I remember effectively being told that I was broken, you know, that there was a chemical imbalance, you know, 
from the psychiatrist and the psychologist. So it wasn't just a feeling, it was actually reaffirmed by these professionals. Um, I hope that there is a little bit more tact with that stuff now. Uh, I'm sure there are stories from both sides of the spectrum about people who feel like it was handled really well and other people who feel like they were, you know, effectively just told that they were the, they were the problem, just like I was. Um, so I think it, a lot of it depends on the context in which it, it's delivered. But for me, even though the best of intentions were there, I still absolutely felt like I was not capable of dealing with this, with the tools that, you know, I had been given when I was born, that I needed outside help that I needed pharmaceutical help more than that because the people I was working with were not helping me find the strength within myself. They were just saying, oh, you have a problem with your brain. You know, it's not your fault, it's your brain's fault. So here, take these drugs. Yeah, and and just to clarify, did you believe that story about your brain that you had some imbalance and that kind of thing? Absolutely, I completely believed it. I, I had no reason not to because when I was a kid, I was 15, mm -hmm. I'm you know, I wasn't the most, like, I was fairly sheltered, you know, at that point, my life was really just getting good grades and getting asked to the prom, like, I put all doctors on a pedestal, because all adults were on pedestals, they all knew more than me, and especially ones who had been trained for a very long time, so I, there was, I had no outside influence telling me otherwise, um, and it, and it wasn't malicious, that's the most heartbreaking part, like, it was, when everyone's telling you things like that in good faith, you especially have no reason not to believe them because everyone's just trying to help, right? That's the line. We're just trying to help. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um, in the book, you describe, you know, after being on the meds for 10 and a half years that you're hanging out your high rise window and thinking about how long it would take to hit the ground. So I mean, I assume that means you were actively suicidal at that point. Um, and then also you describe some other disturbing type thoughts and, and urges that you had in the book. Um, so I'm just wondering from your experience, do you think the, the psychiatric medications themselves and the withdrawal um, caused you to be actively suicidal um, and do you think you were like at risk of harming other people? Were you ever having like violent type thoughts or urges or intrusive thoughts, that kind of thing? So it's, we'll start with the active suicidal part. So it's very odd because I think that from the, if I had had a psychiatrist or a psychologist at the time and was describing this stuff, I'm sure they would have described it as like an active risk, but mm -hmm. it really, it almost didn't feel like it when it was happening to me because it had creeped up over the years. So it was actually, I was on the drugs for 15 years and the feeling of not wanting to live, you know, it started off with being blase and that kind of, then it kind of transitioned into not wanting to live. And then it kind of transitioned into actively wanting to die. And then it was like, okay, like, what are the ways that that could happen? It, it wasn't, you know, you hear of these stories where people start taking some psychiatric drug, and then they're like, fine, one minute, and then the next minute, they, you know, do something postal, like, that was yeah. not my experience. It was so slow, mm -hmm. that it actually felt very normal to me to be like, considering all of these things, and I wasn't really scared of it. And so it just felt normal in a way that I can't say, like I almost have said before, I can't, I wasn't scaring myself because I wasn't really scared about not being in the world anymore. So it just kind of felt very, very normal, um, which is an odd thing to say. And, but I do think that the drugs had a, had a role in that. I think that having, having my, you know, my, my chemicals messed with for so long is what created the chemical imbalance to make that seem normal and to make it seem like like I had like no fear response at all. That is objectively not a normal thing. And I think that happened because of all the years of being on the drugs. Um, now, when I tried to get off them though, that was a very different experience. That was much more of a one minute I was fine. And the next minute I wasn't. And then I was not fine for a really long time. Mm -hmm. um, and I did have the intrusive thoughts for me were always the worst part of of withdrawal. Mm -hmm. um, so specifically effects are withdrawal because the intrusive thoughts for me were incredibly violent. And so I, that's when I did start to worry that, okay, maybe like what, 
I'm seeing myself do terrible things to myself and other people in my head. Like, what's to stop me from actually doing it? That was a terrible thought. And then the feeling of, oh, if this is what I'm like without the drugs, like, this is how I operate in the world, then like, I actually am crazy. I actually need serious psychiatric help. Mm -hmm. And I was really lucky that right when that had happened, I had talked to a family friend who's a psychologist who said to me that crazy people don't know they're crazy. And so that in itself meant that like, I I wasn't, you know, clinically mm -hmm. insane and that I wasn't going to hurt anyone. And so we had to deal with the intrusive thoughts, but I could kind of let go of the fear of actively hurting someone. Um, and that was such a huge gift for me because had I gone back to my psychiatrist, I'm sure I would have been committed if I told her what I was seeing and feeling. So yeah. um, I got the intrusive thoughts to me. I, they're just like, they just, as someone who like really would never, you know, hurt a fly, like to then have that suddenly enter into your brain is just a completely destabilizing experience. And when you don't know how long it's going to last and I was also really angry because I had, I felt just so cheated and so duped from being told about these drugs and how like they were supposed to help me and here they were actively hurting me and not helping me and just feeling like somehow I was the only one in the world who knew this information and didn't know what to do with it or how to handle it. Like, I just said, thank God that there's more resources out there for people now because there really wasn't in 2016. And I yeah. really just think that I was a very small subset of people having this reaction and yeah. that no one would ever believe me. Yeah. I was going to ask that. Did you find the support groups? And also did you realize at that point that you were having the intrusive thoughts that you were in drug withdrawal, psychiatric drug withdrawal, mm -hmm. because I'm just thinking back to my own experience when I was having them, having the knowledge that I was in withdrawal it made it so much different that it's like, okay, you could self-talk, you know, you could say, this is from the change in your brain. Mm -hmm. But I always said to myself, it would have been really scary if I never would have figured out that I was in withdrawal, because then I feel like maybe you're at greater risk of acting on them. Cause you think they're yeah. real, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, I, so in 2016, I remember Googling like effects or withdrawal symptoms because I got up the effects are first and then later on it was the Wellbutrin and most of my really uh, terrifying withdrawal stuff came from the effects are so I googled it and I I think um surviving antidepressants came up and maybe a few other things like but they were very clinical they were kind of like a few papers on google scholar so at the time surviving antidepressants was really the only thing and I stayed on there long enough to learn that this is a real thing, what I'm experiencing, that other people have experienced this too. And then I started to read other people's experiences and just reading about people who had been in withdrawal for years. And the idea that this would take years, or I, I just basically shut my computer and was like, I cannot, I cannot spend too much time in other people's pain because my own is bad enough. And so I, as soon as I learned, okay, this is a withdrawal thing, I was like, okay, I'm good. I'm angry. So I was I got real mad. So then I wasn't going to go back on any of these drugs. And I just kind of got on the ride, I guess is the best way to say it. It wasn't graceful, but I got on the ride and I just said, this is, I'm never going to take these again. Even if I have to experience this for the rest of my life, like at least, at least I'm feeling something. At least I know that like I'm in there somewhere. And I just prayed that there would be another facet to the experience right and it turned yeah. there was eventually I started to see the real beautiful um parts of 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 myself that started to come in in the in the windows right I color started to become brighter and I started to feel a little bit more creative and sometimes I would laugh in a way that I hadn't laughed before and you know it, it sounds so very corny but it really did feel like I was kind of awakening and becoming alive for the first time and I would have those little moments and they would only last for sometimes like a few seconds and then it would be like four days of hell but the fact that I got a couple seconds for me was just like some like I'm in there somewhere and if mm -hmm. I can get a couple seconds maybe I can get a couple minutes one day and that little bit of hope plus just sheer anger towards the situation <laughs> is what kept me going through.
Yeah. It's listening to you. Like I'm smiling and nodding my head because I feel like I've said all along, those of us who've been through this, we're in this club that like nobody wanted to join, but we're a part of it. But we also have like our own language and our own secret, you know, society almost that you can't, this is so far beyond the realm of like human experience, what happens to you that um, it, it almost like you can't explain it to someone who's not had, it. I mean, you can try, you know, but it's, it's so difficult to do so. But some of the things you say, like, um, I was trapped inside myself. Like I say that all the time, it feels like you're in there, but you can't get out, you know? And uh, it was said to me too, um, that cra crazy people don't know they're crazy. That was something my dad used to say to me all the time to like, get me to, so it's, it's just funny to me, like how so many people's experiences going through this, like it has to be real that we're having this because we're all saying the same things and we're all, yeah. you know, experiencing. And so that's what the frustrating part, the anger that you talk about is like, if doctors and researchers and everything just open their mind to this and look at us and listen to us and study us, we're all saying the same thing. So yeah. this is happening, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it really is like, I, it is the stories I hear, you could basically copy and paste them. And they're from people all over the world of all different ages. And interestingly, of all different drugs, I hear the same thing from people who are on like antipsychotics as I do from people who are on antidepressants. Like there's, it's, I mean, I've had the same thing. I've had people who, um, a friend of mine's going through uh, withdrawal right now off of Exer, and I've literally sat across the table from him and he's said lines that I wrote in my book. And I'm just sitting there like how, there, it is so strange to be connected to someone who has a completely different life experience than you and a completely different biology. And mm -hmm. yet the words and the experiences are verbatim similar. So yeah, yeah, hopefully we get further with this it's just so infuriating that this has been ignored for so long and yeah so many people are suffering so you mentioned the I guess it was a psychologist that you talked to um but you also had your mother who believed you and supported you which you know I feel like is huge there's some people who who do this all by themselves and I have no idea how but I'm just wondering how integral you know was your mom in your healing and also because she's your mother and you were medicated as a teenager I ask people in your same situation all the time like did you resent her at all for um signing off on this since you were so young um my mom is like the hero of my story <laughs> you know I think it was my dog that kind of kept me from really you know going through with any kind of serious self-harm but it was my mom who I think like she picked up the phone every single time I called for basically my entire life. She's picked up the phone every single time. And until I went through this experience, I didn't know how important that was. Um, but she never viewed me as broken. And she always made that really, really, really clear. Even when I was seeing psychiatrists and even when I was seeing psychologists, she never treated me like I was fragile or like I needed this outside help. She always said that I had the power to heal myself and get better. And I didn't understand that for a really long time. And I got very angry and annoyed with that, especially mm -hmm. in my younger years when the maturity wasn't quite there. Um, excuse me. But in retrospect, that constant reinforcement that I was not broken from someone who knew me arguably better than I knew myself. She certainly knew me longer. You know, she knew me since before I was born. Mm -hmm. She raised me when I was a kid. She knew what, she knew what I was like, you know, kind of out of the oven with no imprints. And she always said like, I know that child, I know that heart, like it's still in there. And so that was just so important to hear. And I think for parents, it's something you've got to just instill in your kids that if no one else believes believes your kid in the world, you've got to um, when it comes to this stuff. But as far as resentment, I think it's because she never viewed me as broken that I also never resented her because, mm -hmm. you know, she, yeah, she was the one who signed off to 
medicate me because she had to because I was a minor but she was just following the doctor's orders it's not like she knew any different at that time you know we had dial-up internet we couldn't do our own research in the way we could now it was just a very different time and so you know I know that she had never really wanted me to be on the antidepressants as long as I was but I was also in charge of my own medical decisions you know two and a half years after I was put on these drugs so she couldn't do anything um and you know it's really only been you know, in the past couple of years that we've really been able to untangle this now that I have the hindsight and I'm off the drugs. And all I know for sure is that she did the best she did. She could at the time. And it would be useless for me to resent that in any way, especially when I have someone who's so loving and constantly supportive and for whom my life would not be as wonderful as it is without her. So, um, and I know that it's clearly been really hard for her, but we just talk about like, I'm so glad I did this now, right? You know, I'm 36 now. I got off these drugs when I was 30. Hopefully, if I'm lucky, I still got 60 great years ahead of me, right? Yeah. So there are a lot of people who come to me who, who are in their 50s or 60s, and it's not the same situation. So I'm just, we're just both so grateful that we have the time we have now and that we're both healthy. Yeah. You said that, um, you know, it annoyed you a little bit. Uh, some of it was being a teenager, you know, your mom saying like, it's within you to heal and that kind of yeah. thing. But do you think some of that <laughs> was because also you embraced the diagnosis so much that any type of saying like, you're not broken sort of challenged mm-hmm. the validity of you identifying with this mm-hmm. disorder that you had? Mm-hmm. Uh, 100%. Like, there's, there's no, there's no doubt in my mind. I, I, in a certain sense, really enjoyed being sick. Mm -hmm. I really liked that. I felt, you know, I felt special in a way like that. I was, you know, more fucked up than other people. Sorry. I hope I could say that. Um, I was more screwed up than other people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that made me special somehow. And, you know, I don't know. I'm an only child. Maybe I just like all the attention on me or maybe that's just part of my personality, but like that was a real thing. And especially as a teenager. And then when you're in your twenties, when you don't, you know, you're forming your identity, you're very driven by your peers. You are always comparing, you're always comparing yourself to other people. It's a very convenient to have, you know, diagnosable reason for why your life is a mess and mm-hmm. I just leaned into that really hard it wasn't something that I advertised I mean god forbid had TikTok been a thing when I was a high schooler I probably would have been mm-hmm. miserable on it but it was it was an internal thing very much um and I think I, I really needed that you know intellectual and cognitive maturity and you know prefrontal cortex development to start realizing like how much of a story I'd been telling myself all those years and I think that's a big reason why I couldn't hear my mother when she would say these things and I couldn't really hear anyone else whether or not you know it was you know someone who was very accomplished from like a research standpoint or you know a healer or even a psychologist whatever it was like I couldn't hear it until it got so bad that I had to be willing to put aside my own crap Mm-hmm. and maybe pay attention to what other people in the world had already learned. And so I think that's why it took me so long. Um, I do think a lot of that had to do with the fact that I had to undo the identity that was kind of thrust upon me at a time when I was forming my identity as a teenager. Mm-hmm. So it's a little different than had this happen when I was 35, but um, yeah, I didn't want to listen to anyone. Yeah. But then I'd have yeah. to like do hard stuff and fix my life and who wants to do that? Right. Yeah. Makes sense. I think that's part of the reason some people get on the meds to begin with. It's supposed to be like a quick, easy, like no work type of thing. You just take it and it's supposed to be some miracle, you know, and we know that that's not the case, but so back to your mom, I guess, what do you think she would say to parents considering <laughs> medicating their teenagers now or children because we're putting kids on these things and maybe what would what would you say if you think they would be different messages um I know exactly what she would say because I've asked her this before Mm -hmm. and she said I I tell people and I would tell people parents that they need to get help for themselves first Mm -hmm. and I think that is the same answer that I would give too um because 
there's a very odd, odd tendency uh, right now in this country and well, other countries and sure, but this one, this is the one I'm most familiar with. There's mm -hmm. a very odd tendency to look at the children as the problem as which makes no sense, right? Because the children are a product of the environment they're in and the people who are raising them. So if you've got a child who's exhibiting some sort of, you know, scary psychological issue, I don't understand why we're asking the question, what, what's wrong with the child? Mm -hmm. when the question we need to be asking is, what's happening to the child? And very often, that is a reflection of the parents that there is something that they are doing. And even if they're, you know, maybe they're the greatest parents in the world, but they're bad partners and the kids seeing that, whatever it is, right? The parent needs to get help from themselves to understand their role in their child's, you know, emotional situation. I think until we can start shifting that, until we can start bringing uh, the parents' mental health into child psychiatry, we're really not going to get anywhere on this topic because the stuff doesn't happen in a vacuum. There's always something happening 99% of the time, right? I'll leave the door open for some spontaneous cases, cases, but most of the time something has happened. So the parents need to get help for themselves first and then like watch what happens, right? A lot of the time that kid's probably going to start improving if the parent starts working on their own issues. Um, and I think I would say the same thing too. I just, I hear too many horror stories about kids who say, I was medicated when I was nine. Well, what happened to you when you were nine? Um, you know, my parents got a divorce. They were yelling all the time and, you know, our dog died, whatever it is, right? That's an issue that the parents need to work on with each other and then let the kid have their time to work on it. Not to just say, oh, the kid is screwed up because of our choices. Like it's backwards. Yeah. And every single psych, uh, psychologist, therapist, social worker that I've ever interviewed for this channel has said the exact same thing that you just said, by the way. So I think you're on to something. I um, mean, our yeah. system is terrible. It's really not set up to support parents, especially, you know, if people who are uninsured or hell, even if you have insurance, it doesn't guarantee good care. So it's not like I have the answer here, but mm -hmm. I do think that it, that, that that needs to be the first line of defense, right? And if the parent is resisting, well, that to me is a huge problem. So yeah, like, yeah, the system is the problem, but also people are the problem. Yeah. So um, you got off the medications and went through the withdrawal syndrome. And um, how, I guess I want to know, like, how was it? How, how did it feel? How long did it take? All of that. Uh, so I think for me, like serious withdrawal. And I define that as like, kind of a f as feeling like someone put you in a washing machine and you're just getting bounced around and you have no idea where you are in the cycle. Like that to me feel like, it feels like it felt, it took about a year. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I remember just this one moment where things just kind of shifted. Like I was just standing in a room in Portugal, or not in Portugal, in Prague. And, um, honestly, it just seemed like someone turned the lights on. And I just kind of remember looking around and feeling lighter and just like, kind of like, huh. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of the moment where I think withdrawal like ended for me. But then there was about another year after that of just feeling really kind of unsteady in my body and not knowing like, okay, what do I like? Like what things make me feel good? What things make me feel bad? What do I want to do for a job? Like, because everything was gone at that point. I had lost my I left my job, left my home. Like I didn't have anything that resembled who I was before. So that following year was really difficult. And another, for another reason, um, I wasn't being in the washing machine of withdrawal quite as much anymore, but I had no idea who I was and I had no idea how to rebuild that, you know, as a 30 year old. And so that was really uh, scary and discombobulating, but just in a different way. Um, you know, didn't have any savings because I hadn't been focusing on that. But, you know, just like all the life stuff, I felt like I didn't know how to do, had to learn how to do that kind of over that next year. Mm -hmm. And then after that point is when I started to kind of rebuild the life that I have now and feel good about it. So, um, you know, the actual process of withdrawal for me was very classic windows and waves. I would have uh, days, sometimes weeks of just kind of crushing symptoms, whether or not it was the intrusive thoughts or, you know, uh, bouts of rage or just 
general emotional, being an emotional disaster. I had a lot of uh, noise sensitivity, which was really problematic given that I was living in New York City. So I was just struggling to even go outside um, and like do my job. And then I would have these kind of very random windows where, you know, I noticed the smell of coffee and how wonderful that was. And it was like, I'd never smelled coffee before, or, you know, I woke up and had a few hours in the morning of feeling calm. And those windows gradually started to expand. Again, it took a while. Um, but when they happened, I really, I really noticed them. Yeah. Um, and then, like I said, for me, it almost kind of stopped in some ways all at once. And it was like the window was kind of permanently there. Sometimes it was a little cloudy, but it was a window nonetheless. Yeah. So you say you had to sort of figure out who you were and just like basically start a whole new life as this person that emerged from withdrawal. So I wonder when you were medicated, do you feel like you were just like sort of existing like a numb zombie? And do you have much memory of that time or is it all sort of foggy and blurry? Yeah, I was, um, I, I just, I just felt really disconnected. Like I was going through the motions and I knew, I knew how to do all the motions. Mm -hmm. I, I was a dancer growing up. So performing was, is very natural to me. So I could, uh, you know, I could act like I was exactly how I was supposed to be acting. And it mm -hmm. didn't even feel like I was acting. It was almost just like, I was kind of clicking on and off into a character and then I'd come home and just kind of be flat. Um, but I, I do have a lot of memory loss, uh, from basically the year or two around when my dad died is pretty much completely gone. I don't, the very specific memories I don't remember from that time. And then, uh, my time living in New York and in college is, is extremely spotty too. Um, and my business partner used to yell at me because we'd have a conversation about something and I just wouldn't remember it. So I wouldn't do whatever we talked about. And that was kind of when I started to realize there's a problem here is because both my mom and my business partner were reporting that they told me stuff that I couldn't remember. Um, and so that whole time is really fuzzy. I feel like, I feel like it really didn't happen to me. And it's like, it happened to somebody else. And also like, it was a decade that I was living in New York um, when this was all going on. And it's amazing how few specific memories I have of that time it just kind of feels like the cliff notes version and I guess that's it yeah like, hard to know if that's normal or not but given the past six years have been so much richer and I feel a lot more distinct in the way I think about the past I, I think it was just r related yeah mm -hmm. so you wrote a piece for Madden America and we'll link it in the comments oh. for anybody who wants to read it and you said in that piece every day I wonder who I might have been if that doctor yeah. and all the doctors that followed made a different recommendation. Mm -hmm. So at this point where you are in the process, um, I guess I want to know, like, because you're feeling better and you feel like you're connected now and you sort of get the second chance. Mm -hmm. um, are you still angry, grieving? Have you reached a place of acceptance? And then the big question that everyone asks, which you've probably gotten a million times, like, are you anti-psychiatry or do you want these drugs banned and taken off the market? <laughs> um, all right, we'll start with the first question. Um, I would say that it, there's probably not a time, like a week that goes by in which I'm just not, in which I'm not aware of everything I feel like I lost. Like, I do think I'm I'm starting to get to the point, and I think the book really has helped with that, where I feel a sense of purpose in the world that I didn't ever feel before. Mm -hmm. And that helps me feel less cheated. Um, but then I go through other experiences, um, you know, like specifically with relationships. I didn't have any romantic relationships when I was medicated, really. Um, I had my first, you know, grown up unmedicated relationship when I was 31. And I feel like I have learned the lessons I've had to learn during that time. It, it feels like it, it feels like I'm 31 years old trying to go back to seventh grade and learn it. And that's been really, really frustrating. And that's not the only thing too, but that, that's the most kind of salient in my mind is um, just how behind I've felt on a lot of things. 
that mm -hmm. I have to learn now. And I'm frustrated that I'm making the mistakes that I'm making now because I didn't get a chance to make them when I was 22 when it was appropriate. Because now I feel like, well, God, you know, time's passing me so fast. And these are mistakes for young, young people and I'm having to learn it now. And that just irritates me because I really want to be, you know, a 36 year old in these relationships, not 16. Mm -hmm. um, that really doesn't make me seem too flattering, but uh, you know, it's, it's fine. Um, <laughs> but it's just a good example of, yeah. of something that like, I just, I feel really stunted in a lot of ways. And that one in particular has given me the most challenges. Like, I feel like I fundamentally don't get how to relate to other people a lot of the time. And I don't know what's me and I don't know what's them. And it's just very confusing when you're in like a long-term, you know, partnership or friendship or whatever it is. Yeah. So um but like I said I do feel like I have a lot more purpose now in the world which is something that I think everyone's searching for when they're young and it just makes life a lot better when you feel like you have something to fight for um but as far as whether or not I'm you know quote-unquote anti-psychiatry like I mean that's a trap of a question <laughs> mm -hmm. you know there's no way I can answer that without pissing someone off I think the the more honest answer here is that like these drugs aren't going away. Nothing I do or you do or any support group is going to do is going to be big enough to make these drugs go away. So I think the best thing that I can do is to share a different path for people to, to let people know that, no, you you have more choices in the world than cope with depression or cope with antidepressants. Like there is a third option that is to get off these drugs and it is to heal and just refuse to accept the fact that this is a, you know, lifelong thing. So that's what I hope to do with this. And the great thing is, is that there are people of all, of all, you know, walks of life, of all sorts of different practitioners who believe me, who believe us, who believe that there is another way. And I know psychiatrists who are amazing and who are working to try and get their patients off these drugs. And I know therapists who are trying to help with that too. And there are researchers and hopefully one day we've got clinics that can really help people. And I just, I want there to be that option because there, for every person who thinks that, you know, these drugs are a lifesaver and that they're never going to get off of them and is happy in that experience, there is going to be somebody else who does not want that for their life and we need to have options for those people and I just hope that I can be part of a world where people don't have to go through what I did and that they can get off these drugs and learn about themselves and have a wonderful happy fulfilling life without antidepressant withdrawal and that they can do it safely and happily and as easy as possible so that's what I'm hoping um, that's the world I hope to live in and that's the space I want to live in and if there's other crap happening around me well it's fine but that's my lane <laughs> yeah something you said uh, before the anti-psychiatry answer sort of struck me a little bit and uh, it's something I've thought about for myself too is like they say when you talk to people who have addiction or I guess substance use disorder is the proper term for it now a lot of people in that situation will say that they felt like their emotional maturity and development stopped at the age at which they started using drugs. So when they got sober, they still felt like they were, you know, 16 or whenever they first started using. And so that sort of like parallels kind of what you were saying there that you just feel kind of like at an age that isn't developed to the point where when you compare with your peers, you know, and I've, I've felt the same thing. Like I'm 25 sort of in my mind and my feelings. And that's when I started taking the medication. And it seems to sort of make sense when you think yeah. about psychiatric drugs from, from the perspective of the, this brilliant physician named Dr. Joanna Moncrief, who you may have yeah. you know, met her, read her work where she introduces the, the idea that we shouldn't look at psychiatric drugs as like medications, these special, they're just drugs, like everything else, you know, they impact the brain very similarly to some of the quote unquote illicit drugs. And so it sort of makes sense based on, you know, the description that you just gave of, of sort of being, you know, trapped at a younger age, like when you started. Yeah. I mean, that. that I've, I've always felt like there was a sense of stunting that happened at that time. 
Um, and I don't know, I don't know if it's, you know, a, I don't know if it's a correlation or a causation. Mm-hmm. I think that there's something that happens when you, when you, when you halt a process, a natural process that then kind of just like sends you off on a different tangent and you don't, you just don't take, take in the lessons you're supposed to learn because there's this blending, right? So if you don't have, you know, a big emotional response to, let's say bankruptcy, right? If that's not a thing that you feel like you should be worried about because you don't have the capacity to be worried about it because you're, you know, drugged up to your eyeballs, well, then you're probably not going to go out of your way to learn about financial planning and how to keep yourself out of debt. And so then, you know, if you get off these drugs, if you kind of wake up a little bit and your your finances are a mess, well, that wasn't a choice that was made yesterday. It wasn't necessarily something conscious, but perhaps it was just because you you were kind of asleep and not really paying attention. Mm -hmm. Um, Just one example. Um, But I'm not the only, again, I'm not the only one who's felt this. I mean, I, I, I run into a lot of people who say they just, they kind of like don't know where they are. They don't know how to find themselves. And the problem is that they always try and go back. They go back to the last time they felt whole or the last time they were unmedicated. And we're getting to a point now where people have been medicated for decades. So Mm -hmm. in my case, when I tried to go back to say like, okay, who was I? I was a 14 year old child who hadn't gone through a trauma. There was no way that I could then pull out that person and apply it to being a 30 year old adult. So what do you do? And I, and I get that all the time from people who are just like, they are trying so hard to go back to where they were. And that's, it's never going to get you anywhere. You absolutely have to look forward. It's a one way road and you have to start over and say, Mm -hmm. doesn't matter where I was, who, who am I now? And you start with the basics. I mean, for me, literally my palate changed, like what I like to eat changed before and after in a depressant. So I started with like, well, hated this for 15 years. Let's see if I like this now. And started eating different things, listening to different music, watching different television shows. And I was kind of just taking this, you know, inventory of how I felt. And you got to do that for your whole life. And that means that people sometimes have to go, cities have to go, you know, jobs. It's, it's the only way to move through it because you do have to basically do a whole bunch of work that you should have spent many years doing gradually. Yeah. You suddenly have to do all at once because, you know, the protective armor or whatever you want to call it is ripped off and now you're in your situation. So you have to yeah. do it fast. Yeah. That makes total, I mean, such a good example that you gave there. Um, you were a panelist at the Medicating Normal Screening in Calgary at the Preventing Overdiagnosis Conference this year. And I'm just wondering from that experience and even from, you know, putting your book out or giving an early copy to medical professionals, I guess, what is your impression about how the medical community is receiving some of these issues now? I mean, my big goal with this book is to get it in med school curriculums and specifically, you know, psychiatric residencies. So if anyone out there can help, like, let's do that. Um, Honestly, I have been, I mean, like anything else, I have a range of experiences, but I I think that someone asked a similar question in Calgary, and the answer is that, you know, I think existing practitioners, for the most part, Mm -hmm. are a little too far gone, for lack of a better, terrible metaphor. Um, There are plenty of people who who are understanding this and working to better understand how these drugs are affecting people, but I think it's just really difficult to take people who have been in the system and been learning things one way for, you know, 20, 30, 40 years and expect a radical change. Like, it's just not really how most human nature works. And especially, you know, it might be one thing for people in the psychiatric industry because they're dealing with these drugs all the time, but like your general GP who's prescribing hundreds of different kinds of drugs every day, like there's just no world in which it's even reasonable to expect them to know the details of each one of those drugs. They don't have time and they've mm-hmm. got 20 minutes with a patient and they're dealing with insurance and they're up against a system that's not working for them. And then you've got like ER docs, right? They're trying to save your life from a gunshot wound, not worry about whether or not you took your effects or yesterday, even though the effects are might be causing huge physical symptoms that are making their job harder. Mm-hmm. Um, 
without a huge continuing education and a very different very different mantra coming from above from you know the, from the pharmaceutical companies and whatnot i don't really see an immediate change in our current medical leadership however getting in with the med students when they're learning now and i think thank god that like this topic is becoming enough of a, something in the zeitgeist that mm -hmm. We're probably going to see that happen, and I sure hope we're going to see that happen. I, uh, you know, things have gotten better with like opiates, for example. We're not prescribing Xanax and Valium, just like we were to, you know, like my grandmother in the '50s and '60s. So there is, you know, movement. Um, I just hope that we can get the information in earlier, so practitioners of all kinds can start understanding these drugs and, you know, how powerful they are, and hopefully de-prescribing much earlier on in their practice than having to basically, you know, rewrite history now. Um, and when I, I said that pretty much at a Calgary conference to a bunch of, you know, very well-established doctors who've been practicing for 10, 20 years. And at first they were like, I think a little offended. And then when I clarified, they were like, oh yeah, that's correct. You know, and then they all kind of started laughing and it's just, you know, it's not to begrudge any one individual, of course, it's just that it's so much information. It comes from, you know, very top-down entities. Continuing education is the rough thing. There's not as nearly as much research on this as we need. It's just a just a hard road to navigate right now. So the more people who are talking about it, the more physicians that are talking about it, the better. Um, and I really hope that we can get this like straight to the source in the medical schools first. Yeah. Amen to that. So I'm looking at the time and we're coming up on about an hour. And I think we have some questions um, awesome. from the audience. Um, this so one, glad there are people out there. I can't yeah. see We can't you see you are. and we can't talk to you, but you're listening to you're us. There. Hello, yeah. world. Hello, yeah. Dutch people. I know that uh, hopefully there's a bit of a Dutch cohort out there thanks to Anders Sorensen. Oh, nice. Fabulous, fabulous researcher. Been right. Research his work. Yeah. Um, so this person, I, I may have already asked you this, but maybe you have uh, something to add. Um, if you could go back in time, how do you wish your issues would have been dealt with differently? Like I said, for me, the big thing just would have been time. I don't think I was a kid who was at risk of, of, of going down the wrong path or hanging out with the wrong crowd, as, as, as we like to say. So I think I really just needed some time to sort things out. Um, and I think that with continuing ongoing like love and support from family and just kind of the ability to cry it out when I needed and maybe help from teachers if I was, you know, kind of a little off, just a little bit of leniency there within reason is really all I, all I needed. Just, just a little bit more general compassion from the adults around me was what I needed the most in time. Yeah. Okay. And then this person, good question. I don't think I asked you what precipitated you going off the meds. Was there like a moment or something light bulb? Like why? Yes. So this is, it's, this is kind of basically what the book is about. So I had gotten this opportunity completely out of the blue to travel around the world for a year. And I was, I was objectively miserable. So I kind of said, okay, I, I want to take this opportunity. Like, you know, I kind of suicide was on my mind and like I didn't I didn't like it I didn't feel good with that and then I had this kind of golden opportunity and I just kind of said all right well I want to do this and just because my life can't be the same after so but because I was having such bad memory issues I was really cognizant of the fact that I could travel around the world for a year and forget the whole thing mm -hmm. and that in itself was enough for me to say, okay, something's not right here. I shouldn't be this depressed while I'm well on antidepressants if they were working. Um, I don't want to travel around the world for a year and forget it. So the only thing to do was to get off these drugs and discover my baseline and then make a decision. I just didn't think it would take as long as it did. So I ended up spending most of my year abroad in withdrawal, um, which I don't recommend. Um, but on the other hand, it also really, I think, accelerated my healing because I was completely removed from everything I could blame my problems on so it actually probably was the best thing for me even though it didn't make like the actual travel as much fun it wasn't really an eat pray love experience you know right, right. <laughs> so last question you were on chopped in antidepressant withdrawal I was 
how in the hell did you do that? And what was it like? I mean, tell us. So I, I think that some of just my innate ability to be, well, one, just like, I, I just have to win anything I do. I have to win. There's like no other option. So I think the desire to be competitive superseded uh, the withdrawal that was happening at that time. Um, also by that point, it had been a good three, four months. I can't remember the timing since I'd been off the effectsor. So I had started to go through the worst of the effects of withdrawal. I had also started working with a counselor who was more of like an alternative counselor. He kind of did like Eastern Western modalities and blended them together in a way that was really, really effective for me. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to work with him on the fears about Chopped because um, mm -hmm. I was very worried about having like a withdrawal breakdown in the middle of you know an episode and so even just being able to work through that and talk it out um was helped me get through the day and then I think that you know one of the instincts people have when you're in withdrawal is to really retreat and like get into bed and you know hopefully if I like I don't move it won't I won't make it worse but I think in my experience the more I did the better I did because I really <laughs> I really hated that distraction so I'm gonna go um, I really needed that distraction, I think. And so being able to prepare for Chopped, I did a lot of practicing. I made flashcards. Like I, I had a way to really say, okay, there's something else in my life going on other than withdrawal. And it's big and it's scary and it's public. So I really wanted to be as prepared as I could. So I spent a lot of time with flashcards and, you know, focusing on things that allowed me to just even get a little bit of a reprieve. And so, and then on the day of, I think I lucked out a little bit. I was just in a little bit of a window. Um, I, I, I certainly look more together on screen than I was in reality, but I also did get a little lucky just with, with being in a window. Yeah. Well, that is incredible. And congratulations on uh, <laughs> that and releasing your book. And so everybody go out and get yourself a copy of this because it's, yes, it's on sale now. Available um, wherever books are sold. Yes. Um, we'll put link a link in the comments directly to all the places where we know anyways that you can get it from. And yeah, I guess... Um, to close, is there anything you want to share before we go? We're going to link up all of Brooke's social media. So go follow her and um, all of that. But do you have any last closing thoughts? Um, I mean, well, the first is, is that like, I, I love public speaking. So if anybody has any events or anything like that, and you think I'm a good fit, please reach out. Like the reason why I do this work is to share it. So the more I can do that, the better. Um, and then beyond that, you know, I think really my message here is just that like this, this withdrawal can end and you can rewrite your story if you've been put on these medications, especially if you've been, been put on them young. Um, you know, I say, I think in the book at some point that hopefully all the bad years behind me don't have to live up to a bad life. And that's just what I hope to give to people because I didn't have a role model of someone who gotten through this when I went through it. Mm -hmm. And I don't want other people to feel like there's no one out there and there's no hope. So I hope that my story and my book can provide that for people just because there, there really is, there's a reason to be going through this if people are going through it. And it's, it's, the worst thing that ever happened to me, but it's the greatest gift I could have given myself because I love my life now and I never could have said that. And so I just hope that everyone keeps going. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that and for writing the book and for putting your story out there. It's a brave thing to do, especially in the world now that, you know, we're in and, and there's so much judgment and people think that, you know, we um, are pill shaming and all of that when really it's just, we want people to learn, you know, from what we experienced and, um, and also to not feel alone, like you said. So it's, it's so important and, and thanks for being another story out there. Um, so yeah, everybody go get uh, Brooke's book and thanks so much for joining us for this live discussion. If you've not seen Medicating Normal yet, you can go to our website at medicatingnormal.com slash watch for the many ways you can view it. 
The film is also now available for download on Vimeo, Amazon, Apple TV, and we're selling DVDs if you're in the United States and Puerto Rico. Check out the events tab on our Facebook page for more upcoming interviews like this one. And lastly, if you'd like to support our outreach efforts to bring the film and more conversations like this one to communities worldwide, you can make a donation at medicatingnormal.com slash donate, or you can buy us a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash mnfilm. All right. Thanks again so much, Brooke, for joining us. It was so good to talk to you. And Thank thanks you. everybody for tuning in. And we'll talk soon. Stay in touch. Let <laughs> us know how book sales and everything else are going. So okay. all right. <laughs> all right. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye. Bye. Take care.